Hello and welcome to podcast number six from the Self-Publishing Formula. Two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. We're into April, Mark. It's becoming spring. Well, at least it's becoming spring at 52 degrees north where we are. Of course, you might be in Australia, in which case you're looking ahead to autumn. But nonetheless, it's a changing time of year and it feels kind of optimistic now. I think things are happening uh, while podcast is getting going, which is exciting. Yeah, we're really pleased with with, uh, the response we've had from listeners. Uh, More downloads than we expect at this stage, which is really gratifying. Um, And I've had some lovely emails and messages on on the uh, selfpublishingformula.com page. So thanks for that. Uh, Keep listening. Yeah, we've had some great feedback. And uh, we often, authors often talk about you should write for yourself. And in a way, we're sort of doing a podcast for ourselves, aren't we? Because the interviews, we are really enjoying doing them and, and gleaning a lot. And today is no exception. Um, But before we move on to today's podcast, just want to ask you a little bit about London Book Fair. I know you went last year and you're planning uh, to go again this year. So what's in store for you at at LBF, which is, um, we should say, Olympia uh, around 12th to 16th? 14th. 14th of April. Yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, So, yeah, I'm going to be there again this year um, speaking um, on the Amazon uh, panel on the Tuesday and Wednesday at 10.45, I think it is, uh, in the Author HQ, um, and then taking questions afterwards. And I'll, I'll be around um, to speak to people individually if they want to, um, for as long as there are people to ask me questions afterwards. Um, and uh, you are going to be there with John, uh, the, the yep. third of the Three Stooges, um, to talk to people who might be interested in talking to us. And I think you're going to be taking a recorder down as well. Yeah, so we're going to do a bit of podcast recording whilst we're there and a little bit of video stuff as well. And we might drop some of that into our Facebook page. But uh, we'd love to say hello. We'd love you to come and say hello to us. So if you are planning to go to the London Book Fair, um, drop us a note, drop us an email at support at selfpublishingformula.com or drop a note into Facebook or simply walk up tap us on the shoulder and uh, and use the secret password which is what i forgot what the secret password is mark um uh, that's well, it um <laughs> so you look slightly hesitant and say um that's how most people approach me anyway so now we would seriously yeah. we'd love people to come and say hello and uh that would be really good and we'll also we're going to get as much as we can that's useful out of lbf the london book fair uh, as possible for the podcast and we'll we'll do some stuff from the London Book Fair itself and then we'll put some stuff in the can as well because obviously not everyone can get there most I know most of our listeners are in the states um, but there's a lot of useful stuff that will come out of that and this podcast will be a good place to glean some of that in the weeks to come absolutely good cool let's move on to today's interview so quite author based quite writing based but a little bit also about marketing and uh, it's a, a great character it's his name is russell blake many of you would have heard of him uh, mark and russell actually did a, a joint promotion uh, a few months back so they've done a little bit of business together but this was the first time that the two of you actually spoke wasn't it it was yeah so russell is is fairly infamous within the community of a very wise um he probably hate me for saying that but he, know, he really knows what he's talking about um, and yeah, we got on the phone with him. He's down in, in Mexico, so uh, he's kind of partially tequila fueled, possibly. Yeah. Uh, maybe even on his side as well. Um, and yeah, it was a really good chat. So I hope um, everyone got, gets as much out of this as, as we did when we spoke to him. So, Russell Blake is the USA Today best-selling author of 30 books, no less. In fact, I bet it's going to be more. We'll speak to him in a second, including the Jet series. Uh, He's featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Times, the Chicago Tribune, and notably Russell's co-author of The Eye of Heaven and at least one other book that I've noticed with the legendary Clive Cussler. Russell writes under the moniker R.E. Blake in the young adult contemporary romance genres. Uh, He's also, from our point of view, a well-respected voice on the indie publishing circuit with a blog that's always forthright and to the point. His opinions are always worth listening to. And hey, we're delighted to have you along, Russell, all the way from Mexico. Lovely to be here. Hello, gentlemen. Lovely to be there in the sun, I would say. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) uh, If you you hear mariachis and screaming in the background, that's uh, that's just par for the course. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Well, Russell, look, thanks so much indeed for joining us. Um, You you know the basic thing that's going on here. I'm setting out on the journey. Mark's uh, advanced, but I'm I'm going to get in first with my question because. 
Uh, you've been incredibly successful. You're a very good writer, very well respected. I'm not just saying this because you're on my podcast, but I'm also a bit blown away by the amount you've written. I mean, you are you're prolific. Uh, so I want to know what your sort of what my focus should be so that I can get somewhere within the the realm of you within perhaps 10 years, 5, 10 years. What should I be focusing on at this stage of my career? Well, I think you should you should plan on marrying rich. That's that's my first tip. <laughs> uh, that Actually, was, if you do that, that you don't sale. really need to do anything else. So. Yeah, <laughs> you can write your memoirs, hopefully. So, no, just truthfully, I, I think you know the thing you need to focus on as a first time um, content creator, as a first time author, is really to um, master storytelling. And you notice I don't really say craft which is really the you know involves structuring sentences and pacing things and word choice and vocabulary but mainly just storytelling because i mean that's at its essence what a a book is it's a story so it sounds obvious but if you can deconstruct other people's work and become familiar with what works and what doesn't within your genre you're going to be way ahead of the game because you'll understand how to tell a story in as well-paced and as compelling a manner as possible. So I'd say focus on the storytelling and on deconstructing other people's work, the work of people who you think do a particularly good job within your genre. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think already it's, you know, since I started thinking about writing and started writing, it's, it's impossible to purely enjoy a book anymore. You know, you read a no, book. And, and that's part of the occupational hazard of, of, I imagine, movie guys are the same way. I mean, if you're Quentin Tarantino, you probably can't sit down and watch a movie and just enjoy it hmm. because you're constantly going, what's he doing with his POV? What techniques are they using? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How is he pacing the story, telling what's happening off screen, what's happening on screen? So you get involved in all the technical aspects, but I think it's important to master the technical aspects so you understand what you're doing and then basically forget about all of them. In other words, once you understand the the foundation and the bones, the dynamics that go into telling a story in a good versus a clumsy way, forget all the technique and just tell a good story. Okay, that sounds good. Mark, you're a you're, I know you're a fan of Russell. In fact, the two of you have collaborated, haven't you, in some marketing ventures? I haven't made that up, have I? You've done that. <laughs> no, we did. We, um, Russell and I both, um, for about two or three months last year, we put together a Facebook ad that uh, gave away the first book in the Jet series and the first book in my Milton series. And I can't remember what the numbers were now, Russell. We, we added a few thousand to our list. Yeah, our no, list, it, didn't we? It, 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 it was very successful. Thank you. I, I, I consider myself fortunate to have been able to work with you on that. Yeah, it was it was it was good for me too. I mean, it's just uh, kind of introducing our, our books to different audiences. So that was that was that was really great. Yeah. But one thing that James said I thought was interesting is looking at your 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 creative process. Um, and I think we're probably quite similar in the way that we we look at things. When I was when I started out, I wanted I had all these grand ambitions of trying to write books that would win prizes, and they were they were shit because yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm 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 not that kind of writer. And sure. In the, at the end of the day, what I the kind of decision I came down to was that I wanted to. I have got a mortgage to pay, and I wanted to look after my family. So it, I wanted to write books, and beyond that, actually, I wanted to write books that people read and enjoyed. Page turners, and that's something you you are absolute master at writing page turning fiction. Um, you know, the, the, we're not we, neither of us are going to win the Pulitzer, um, but we we're probably going to sell quite a lot of books. Is, well, speak speak for yourself. I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping that the, I'm waiting for the call. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, very generous praise, kind words. I've read some of your stuff, and you are a, a masterful storyteller yourself. And um, by the way, there's no charge for the lotion job, guys. <laughs> yeah. It's perfectly, <laughs> perfectly so, acceptable within the context. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's move on. I mean, storytelling is, is fantastic. And I think that um, the, the sales that you've made and the friends that you've made, frankly, people like Clive Cussler, kind of speak for the fact that you are somebody who's, you know, nobody, everyone writers full of insecurities right so nobody sits there thinking i've got it cracked and i'm not going to say you've got it cracked but you are somebody who understands a story and is, is working on that and, and turning it into well let's say this is all as well turning it into something profitable which moves me on to kind of the marketing side of things can we tap your experience uh, on the marketing side what's your advice for somebody starting out and what's your advice for somebody who's already down the road in the way that you and mark are 
Well, I, I, you know, as a beginning author, I mean, I, it took me a while to figure this out, um, but I think you have to really view um, the business of publishing your work as a completely separate um, endeavor than creating content, which is the writing of the book. Because frankly, the skill set that makes you a good writer doesn't have really anything to do with operating a successful publishing company, which is where you're marketing the books, you're packaging them, you're um, editing them, you're making decisions on on what product is the best fit for a genre. Um, so it, it, I tend to view, and this is an, an iterative process that's that's taken probably a few years to to be able to synthesize and articulate clearly, assuming I am articulating it clearly. I view it as as content creation, which is writing books and telling good stories, and publishing, which is packaging those stories and marketing them and reach communicating to an audience that you have a product that is both worth paying for and that they will be interested in if they knew it existed. And I think as a, as, as a beginning author, certainly understanding that those are two separate disciplines and the skill sets don't necessarily translate across and that you're signing up to be good at both of them uh, means that you, you have to split your time. You have to commit to the discipline of putting in X amount of time on the publishing marketing side and X amount of time on the content creation side. And I think once you approach it that way, you're able to better, you know, I hear a lot of, of beginning authors certainly saying, you know, I just don't like the, I'm not comfortable with the self-promotion. I'm not comfortable with the marketing side. I'm not good at that. And it's like, well, sweetie, that's what you signed up for. I mean, you, you're, you're trying to operate a publishing company. So if you just want to be a purely content creator and not be in the publishing business, which is essentially a retail game, um, then go ahead and just write good books, shop for an agent, hope lightning strikes, and, you know, best of luck to you. But if you're going to try to do both and self-publish, just recognize that you are signing up to not only the content creation side of it, but the retail marketing side of it. And I think that's where, where a lot of authors um, stumble because they, they're uncomfortable with that idea. They, they view it as sort of crass and commercial, and it's like, well, it's it's a retail marketing business. Of course, it's crass and commercial. Mm, yeah, I've, I've I've seen that hundreds of times with with new authors, and I, I remember once I was I was at a, on a panel, and someone asked me from the floor how, how much time I spent on marketing and how much time I spent on writing, and it's probably about fifty fifty for me. And it, maybe that's you know you, you can perhaps suggest what what yours is your split is like in a minute, but when when I said it was fifty fifty, the answer was, well, you're not a real author, then you're not a full time author. And I, yeah, I could have banged my head against the wall when, when you get that kind of answer. It's just, ab and, and that's fine. They can think that if they want, but I was tempted to say, well, if the odds of, if you have that mindset, the odds of you making a career out of writing are very, very slim. You know, it's well, because it's a failure to grasp the, the duality, the, the fundamentals of the business. Content creation is writing books thinking up great stories, mastering the storytelling part, the pacing, all of that stuff, all the good stuff, all the craft, all the artistic and, you know, the fun part. Operating a publishing business, which is what happens when you ask people to buy your content that you just created, that's a different business. And that's why I say if people were clear on that up front, they wouldn't make statements like, oh, well, then you're not really an author <laughs> or, oh, you're, you know, you're, it, it is because, okay, you fail to, what, what he should have said if he wanted to be accurate was, well, then you're not a full-time content creator. Mm. Well, that would be true. You aren't. Yeah. No, exactly. You are, you are an author who also operates a publishing company to sell the content you created. So, yeah, this is a bit, a bit of an extreme uh, extreme example, but kind of I write in the morning. So when I'm writing in the morning, I'm, I'm creating stories and telling stories and tales and things. And then when I change hats and start going into marketing mode, those stories become effectively um, stock keeping, keeping units. They're, yeah. they're, they're widgets to sell. And that sounds terribly unromantic, but that's the truth of it. Well, um, business is by definition terribly unromantic. I mean, it really is. It's, it's, it's the packaging and selling of a product. 
Yeah. So yeah. Let, let me bust in for somebody who's who's sold on the idea. They're not pretentious about it. They're sold on the idea that they can spend their three or four hours in the morning writing and then operate themselves as a business in the afternoon. But they're underconfident about that. They dream this dream about being a good writer and they're working hard at their craft and, and storytelling, etc. And then they look slightly aghast at a world they don't really understand. What, what, what do you say to them about that? Well, I, I'd say that part of what you're signing up to um, is educating yourself about the business aspects of running a retail marketing company. So you have to be very clear that you signed up for both jobs. In other words, just doing one job, that's fine. Then you're a content creator, but don't have any expectation that you're going to be able to market and sell your work, because why would you be able to? What, it, did you pick that up by osmosis, by divine right? I mean, you know, I, I, it, nobody would would say I should be running Microsoft just by proclaiming themselves to be breathing. They they would they would grasp that that has a, a skill set involved, and that you would have to take it upon yourself to educate yourself about that skill set so that you're effective at it. Um, just as nobody on the content side, you know, I always use the example of Yo-Yo Ma. Nobody sits down, picks up a cello and says, I, you know, I should be a, 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 a playing on Carnegie Hall and a cellist. Mm -hmm. They recognize it's going to take 10, 20 years of, of very hard work and committed practice. And even then, they probably won't play in Carnegie Hall. So I sort of, that's why I go back to, you have to be very clear that self-publishing is not just content creation. It is the business aspect of operating a publishing company in a retail marketing environment. Yeah, the clue is the clue is kind of in the name, isn't it? So yeah. It's the publishing bit of the self-publishing. Yeah. <laughs> the self but authors bit. don't hear that. No, they, 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 don't. They, they, they love the Cinderella story where, oh, yeah, no, I just wrote the book, and then I put it up, and it sold six million copies, and now the Olsen twins are coming over, and I've got a big book that's great. You know, it's like, well, yes, we all enjoy that um, fairy tale, but reality is, uh, I know a lot of authors, I, I'm sure you do too, Mark, I mean, they all work very, very hard at both the content creation part and the business aspect. Yeah, and those and those lightning strikes. I mean, Hugh Howey is often put forward as a lightning strike, but which conveniently forgets the fact that he had about ten books behind him before Wool got big. Yeah, no, of course he's he, he's a very 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 good storyteller and author. I've read his stuff. I mean, he's, he's he, I have tremendous respect for the man. So yeah, it wasn't whoops. How did that happen? <laughs> Um, you know, there was some definitely some craft and being in the right place at the right time and, you know, having the right story at the right time and a confluence of events. But, you know, I, I've said in many other podcasts, every success story I know of is an exception. This yeah. is a business of exceptions. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I would say, you know, if, if, if authors recognize that it is the exception rather than the rule to succeed, in earning any kind of a, a living at generating content and then selling it, you know, they, they, that would naturally lead them into the question, well, what's going to make me exceptional? How am I going to be another exception? Mm. And, you know, you can either wait for it to happen, for the universe to recognize your, your brilliance, or you can take steps that will make you an exception. And, you know, for me, I looked at this very clinically when I looked at the business. I kind of went, the, the thing that I can do is write fairly well, and I can generate a lot of content in a, in a short period of time. So my edge, if you will, my exception was that I could create a tremendous backlist of competently crafted, and some would argue that, but competently <laughs> crafted um, thrillers and action thrillers and mysteries and, and get them out there so I'd have a backlist of somebody who's been writing 20 years and have it within 18 months. Mm. I recognize that. I mean, it was very calculated. I was like, this is one of those exceptional things that I can do. And it's no, it's not because I'm um, particularly fortunate or unfortunate any more than someone who's double jointed and can do that odd thing with their thumbs where it kind of bends backwards. You know, you, some people just can do that, in which case they could probably be good card sharps or whatever, <laughs> pockets, and others aren't. So if you can't churn out a lot of product quickly 
and do so at a relatively high degree of quality, that's not going to be how you're the exception. But- that's, I remember when, I, when I, I first started getting into this, uh, probably four or five years ago, when, when you were still more active on keyboards. Mm-hmm. And I remember reading some of your posts and then looking at your, reading some of your books, looking at your backlist and being kind of, uh, you know, struck dumb by how fast you wrote. And I, at that stage, I was still writing maybe a couple of books a year, um, sure. which is it's fast for most people, but it, sure. what I knew it wasn't, I knew it wasn't fast enough. And then in 2014, I, I did, I kind of found something that enabled me to write maybe four or five novels in, in 2014. And that was, that was the tipping point. I just wonder, do you, do you, you have any idea what that is? Because I, I, I think it was for, for me. It would be like the, the confluence of um, starting to get readers, starting to make money, and and finding a, a, a series that I love to write. And those those combined, so that I could write nearly a million words in twenty fourteen. But do you see what do you see from your perspective? Well, I think I think you know. I mean, I think it's all about self motivation, and you can either have your 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 motivation external or internal and you know don't don't get me wrong greed and desperation are wonderful uh, <laughs> drivers cornered rats tend to fight a lot harder than those with options but by the same token also i'm a big believer that the questions that you ask yourself um tend to get different answers so if your if your question you're asking yourself is how can i write six novels this year and have a blast doing it you're going to get a completely different answer than how in the name of God am I ever going to write six novels. So Mm. I tend to try to focus, I'm aware of the power that questions have and and my my motivation levels and my beliefs about what's possible and isn't. And then so I try to structure, I try to craft questions that, that get a better outcome. You know, and, and I talk to people that have writer's block all the time. Oh, I just, you know, I'm just not motivated. And it's like, well, you know, again, sweetie, if you were working for Pixar or for Lucasfilms or something, nobody would really particularly be that interested in whether life got in the way or how you feel today. Your job is to create content to a certain quality level in a certain period of time. So mm. that's the job. If you don't want it, somebody else will be more than happy to take it. So... Mm. That's the job. Yes. So, so I guess in the same way that people think um, they, they're very easy to persuade that they want to get better at storytelling, they're all ears when it comes to how you use Scrivener or whatever and, and divide the chapters up. And then those same people may be the ones saying, I don't really have time to understand Facebook. Well, like you say, Russell, and you say it very well, it's your job. So put the same, <laughs> same amount of professional approach to understanding social media advertising or, or, or main list, whatever, that you do structuring your chapters. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, and that's why I, I, I don't think there's any, you know, I think the old um, adage that, that, you know, there's only one right way to write a novel, but nobody can agree on what it is. Well, there's some truth to that. And people work in different ways. And I think different genres, um, different approaches work better in different genres. But I, I've synthesized my approach to one where I outline now, I don't pants. You know, I outline in a fairly brief manner, and then I write to the outline. I leave myself enough, you know, wiggle room to kind of change the story around and add or subtract things that I find interesting or uninteresting. But I try to write to outline not because I, I fancy myself to be an automaton. Um, it's just because it cuts down on the con- creation time by a factor of three. And I think but, yeah, it, it, differently from almost everyone else that we've spoken to so far, I don't think you, you use Scrivener, do you? No, I, I don't use, I, I just have an Excel spreadsheet and that I have up on my website to show people how I organize my thoughts and I write in Microsoft Word. Scrivener, all of these things are just, you know, they're just ways, they're constructs to basically frame your perspective. Hmm. They're just ways of organizing your thinking. But you don't, you know, you don't require a program to to organize your thinking. You can do the same thing longhand with some some index cards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, stra- strangely, people managed to write books even before computers were around, didn't they? So I've, I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> with with chapters and everything, you know. So, but the power of perception. I mean, a lot of people are like, "Oh, ever since I I found X Y Z software, I've really improved my productivity and blah 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 blah." And it's it's kind of like, okay, well, again, that makes my point. It's the power of perception. Your perception is that this tool is focusing your thinking and organizing you, so you now are more productive. Great, but 
you could do that with absolutely anything. Yeah, it's the placebo effect, isn't it? So at the moment, um, I don't know if you heard of it. There's a piece of software or website called Brain FM that's supposed to mm. uh, produce kind of structured white noise. I suppose I'd call it. It's quite musical, but it's it's supposed to stimulate your brain waves. Now, for me, that's almost certainly marketing BS. Um, sure, it but, sure sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. But saying that, I, a couple of these, I've I've actually tried it, and I my productivity went up by 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 a significant amount. So and he's now it's, Scientologist. Right. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Sure. I, I'm ordering some both right now. <laughs> <laughs> now joined a cult. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's, you only got so many hours on the on the planet, so you might as well enjoy yourself. <laughs> Give it a go. Yeah. Unless you're a Scientologist, in which case. <laughs> yeah. You're, you've got a spaceship to get to. <laughs> Don't um, get me started. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, yeah. But that's. Well, I think the point, to be fair to Mark, you're making is it. It's quite possibly just the placebo. Someone tells you this is going to help you, and that's sometimes what you need, isn't it? To to think you're being helped, and it helps you. I'm sure doctors do this from time to time you know, with the placebo. It's not mm. just a made-up thing, is it, in health? Um, okay, let's, let's... I mean, you talk about doing the best you can to put yourself in a position to have an exceptional success, Russell, and I know that you've got a few uh, tricks of the trade. Now, some of them are quite... what we would now consider quite traditional tricks. I mean, a bit of a, a trailblazer in its day, but I can see you still use the permafree. Uh, I'm just looking at your Amazon page now, and I see that the Night of the Assassin, which looks to be the prequel to the Assassin series... It's free. Uh, Ops Files Jet, uh, I guess, is towards the beginning of your Jet series. Is is free at the moment on Kindle? Is that is that a permanent thing for you? And is that something you still stand by as being a, a stock in trade for, for self publishing authors? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of perma free on the first book in your series. I think that, um, but not you know. Obviously, there's there's some nuance to that. Um, but I, I like perma free. I think it gives um, readers an opportunity to evaluate their work and see whether you're worth their time or not. And it's I view it exactly the same as handing out brownies at Costco. You know, it's like first times for free. Go ahead and taste it. See if you like it. But the idea is that if you do. Um, if the content that you're creating is worth paying for, readers will, you know, you'll attract a certain number of readers that say, I would like more of that brownie, and I'm willing to pay for another bite of the brownie. So that's the idea. It's not certainly it's just retail marketing. Yeah, I've just rewatched uh, some early episodes of The Wire again, and I think what we do with Pomofi is quite similar to handing out free baggies of, of whatever it is that's, uh, you know, sure. stimulating the customers. In Baltimore, it's uh, you know get them get them hooked and then you sell them the hard stuff. That's that's sure. always been what I've done. Yeah, no, I, I think that it's it's actually one of the things that um, indies really have leveraged and and that's been rather smart. And one of their advantages over traditional published authors is that they were able to sort of use that first times for free approach and get discovery in an increasingly difficult to, to gain discovery world. Because it's all about visibility. Assuming you have ten guys, all of whom can write at the same level, and, you know, meaning that it's like that line at the fair. You know, you have to be this tall to get onto the ride. Well, assuming everyone's that tall and can can master their craft to the point where they're qualified to get on the ride, um, one of those or two of those is going to excel while the other eight don't. And generally speaking, it's because more people have heard of that one person than the other eight or nine. And that's where the retail marketing comes in. It's about gaining visibility. And a time-honored tradition in retail marketing is placement, obviously, but also first times for free. Give away free samples. Yeah, I mean, you, you didn't, I mean, you could fill in the audience here a bit, but you didn't come to um, traditional publishing. It wasn't your first gig, was it? You, you've done... You've got quite a lot of experience before you've, you, you've made a success of this business. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've owned businesses. I've worked for companies. I've done a, a few things. And, um, but, but the disciplines never change. I mean, it really, you know, really you're trying to communicate to people that you have a solution to their problem. And if their problem is, for instance, they're bored and they want entertainment or stimulation, the, a possible solution to that is I have the book you want to read. So you, you, you're, you're trying to solve the same problem, whether you're selling construction equipment or building homes or import export, you know, the, the, the fundamentals never change. So, I, you know, I think probably the best thing most 
starting out, what most beginning authors could do is just go get a, a marketing 101 textbook. Just mm-hmm. any old marketing 101 textbook, go spend 10 cents on it at the used bookstore and just read it cover to cover. So how much do you have the customer in mind when you uh, come up with your books? Um, uh, you know, a reasonable amount, but I am the customer for my books. So, you know, I, I basically find it very easy to imagine my audience because I'm the audience for the types of books I write. Yeah. So I, I don't, you know, I, I try not to, I've learned that I have to censor myself somewhat um, because what I enjoy reading might be a little grittier uh, than, than you know, an, an 80-year-old cat lady in a trailer in Alabama. So I have to be sensitive to the idea that, you know, dismemberment and, you know, graphic violence, et cetera, et cetera, may turn off some people. But on the flip side of it, you know, I love Tom Harris. You know, I love mm-hmm. Silence of the Lamb, that sort of thing. Um, so a lot of people don't. They're like, ooh, I don't know about that. It's a little too, ooh, it's cringeworthy. So, you know, I just write to my personal taste and soften it just a little bit. Okay. That's what I do. But you could write some harder stuff in that. Do you think you don't do that because you don't think the market's as big for that? Or I could go full-blown American Psycho with yeah. no problem whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think the audience for it is smaller. Okay. Yeah. It might be even more interesting if I did that. But the problem is, you know, I put on my marketer hat and I kind of go, that product is going to be much harder to sell. So it's a case of marketer Russell speaking to you know, writer Russell right. and, and pulling rank and, you know, that's not well, I have a, you know, I have an agent. Uh, Clive's agent, Peter, is, is my agent now. And, you know, he's a very thoughtful, erudite man who's been in the business forever. And, um, you know, one of the nice things about having a good agent is that they don't bullshit you. They, they tell you, you know, nah, that'll never fly or mm. bad idea. So if you just pretend that you're an agent evaluating someone else's work when you look at a concept, that makes it a lot easier. Mm. takes all the personal sting out of it. It's just kind of like, nah, I'm not going to spend, you know, the next three months trying to sell that. It'll never work. Yeah. Everyone needs an Ari Gold, don't they? The guy, uh, the agent in yeah. Entourage who says that's bullshit. It's not going to work and walks out the office. As soon as yeah. You, you... No, it saves you a lot of time. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Very valuable. Um, okay. Let, well, let's move into a little bit more of the um, the marketing side. I noticed you, you are part of the Kindle Unlimited um program is that something you thought about doing has it worked out for you yeah no i've got i want to say 25 percent of my books 20 percent of my books are are in kindle unlimited and um you know i i'm i'm conflicted on that one i mean the the i i see the value and the reason that i've got a certain number of my books in there is simply so that i don't miss a potential audience but on the flip side of it not a big fan of exclusivity to any one uh channel and uh, frankly, you know, if you if I had five books out instead of approaching fifty, I'd probably probably wouldn't be in the program, depending on which genre I was in, because different genres perform completely differently in Kindle Unlimited. Right. Sci-fi does magnificently in Kindle Unlimited. Uh, post-op does very very well. Certain types of romance. You know, that's really, it seems like that's, you know, a nine to one ratio of borrowers to buyers. Um, so it depends on the genre. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, I've got a couple of books in, in KU, um, but I've, I've agreed with you. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of ex- exclusivity over, over my entire catalog. It's no, just, and I, I don't see the I don't see the financial benefit. I see thirty five, thirty eight percent of my my total income coming from non Amazon um, sales. So you know, that would be a hell of a program. To, it has to be a hell of a program to, uh, to compensate me enough to want to be be exclusive. How did you just as in get, kind of talking about going wide? I mean, how have you approached the other platforms because it's different that then they're very different from from how to do things on Amazon. Well, I actually, Permafree works way better on uh, Barnes & Noble and on Apple than it does on Amazon nowadays. Mm. So I've, I've really, you know, I, I'm, I'm very guilty of completely ignoring Apple and Barnes & Noble in terms of anything channel specific. And yet my sales have been, you know, very, very good. So it's in spite of anything that I've done rather than because of it that, um, that, 
that I'm seeing sales there. In fact, I don't know, maybe you do, Mark. You're, you're you know, the marketing guy. I mean, really, you're <laughs> kind of marketing guru guy. Um, you know, do you do anything differently to hook Apple clients or customers? Um, you're right on, on um, Permafree is much more powerful than Apple right now. And I just did my numbers for February and the numbers on the giveaway that I have, uh, the Milton Starter book, uh, seven or eight times better on Apple than they are on Amazon. Um, so there's that, which is obviously a big thing. In terms of kind of getting noticed on those platforms, in my experience, it's more about um, relationship building than, al- than algorithm tickling, if you like. Um, yeah. So it's you know it's it's getting it's meeting people at um, trade fairs and and being tenacious but not irritating um so kind of asking to be put into promotions and things like that and once, and once you've done that and and it's been successful then they'll come back again um so it's it's yeah and i've done more... you know it's interesting i've never done a book fair i've never done a trade show i've never done any of that i've never met anyone um i i, I just uh, i'm busy writing so i i've never mm. even thought of doing it so there's a, a lot of different ways you can achieve the same the same result yeah, and I've also known I mean, things with like with advertising. If you're spending enough advertising, even if most of my Facebook ads go to are directed towards Amazon, uh, people I think are on Amazon. Um, if you spend enough, there's a big spillover. So I, I have noticed um, big spikes in the other platforms on box sets and things that can only really be attributed to um, to the ads that I'm running. Just just a question of just general visibility. Um, yeah, you know, one of the things I've noticed, though, on Apple, which is odd, I mean, it's just probably a demographic um, sort of, hmm, that's interesting, is uh, that Apple customers tend to be willing to, they're less price sensitive. Mm-hmm. Yep. They tend to Absolutely. be willing to pay more. They don't have a problem paying $7 for an ebook. Yeah, and a really good example of that is Kobo is even better than that. So, um, with and the difference with with Kobo and Apple actually, you there's no kind of ninety nine nine ninety nine limit where the seventy percent royalty stops applying. So, um, I've put together um, all of the books in my Milton series. So, at the moment, eight novels and two novellas, and sell them for twenty five bucks on on Kobo and Apple, and uh, and that's doing really really well. I mean, the return on investment for ads there is is ridiculous. Um, hmm. I, I you see, and I I really need to I need to you know focus on doing stuff like that because I really I don't, um, and I'm probably could increase my sales by ten to twenty percent mm-hmm. by just doing that. But the problem is there's only so many hours in the day. Yeah, tell me about it. That's the- <laughs> hey, yeah, no, I I wish I could clone myself and uh, <laughs> or better yet, clone you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, one thing I really wanted to ask you about is is Kindle World. So so that's not just so that um, readers, sorry, readers, listeners who um, don't know what Kindle Worlds is, it's a program that Amazon introduced that allowed other writers to write within established fictional worlds. So with you, obviously, Russell, it was the, the Jet series became available. And there are lots of books um, that have been published in that series. And I, I just wondered if you'd talk about that for a little bit, because it's, it's not something that is available to, to writers outside of the US. So I don't have any experience of it at all. Um, it, it, it's really, it's pure, it's fan fiction. I mean, that's what it is. It's, it's fan fiction. It's where other authors, whether amateur or professional, um, can, can create stories, usually novellas, in, in a world like the Jet world, using my character, Jet, and any of the other characters I've created, and creating their own characters, and coming up with novel takes on, on the character. You know, and it can be anything. It can be, you know, jet the romance, you know, jet the steampunk version. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, there's no there's no limitations. But the idea is that it's a fun way to get readers to try their hand at writing and to allow other authors who perhaps don't have as much um, exposure and aren't as established to be able to hone their chops and develop an audience using your world as the backdrop and I can think of two immediate examples that have done pretty well out of it one is is Jason Gurley who is uh, a friend of mine who got a massive deal I believe with Crown for his book Eleanor mm-hmm. and he was he was uh, he did covers for me for a while he's also a great guy but he, he started writing in Hughes world in his Kindle world and then another one is Tom Abrams who um, has had a remarkable run in the last four months in the post-apocalyptic 
um, genre and who started really writing in that genre because he wrote in Stephen Conkley's um, Perseid Collapse uh, world, which mm. I also wrote one in. So in both cases, that worked well for them. So it's possible to use Kindle Worlds as a platform to to jump off and you know to jump start your own sort of literary career. And from, but from the perspective of the creator, so you in this case, I mean, from I tried to do something similar to that. So I reached out to a couple of writers whose books I really enjoyed and said, "Look, would would you like?" They're slightly they're not quite as as well known yet, although I think they'll they'll be very well for themselves. And I said, "Would you like to write a book in my Milton world?" And um, they they both or they both started to write it, and they sent me the first couple of chapters for my thoughts, and I just could not go through with it. it I I think you'll probably tell me to get over myself, which is completely <laughs> completely reasonable. But I just, well, I just I felt my, that... my solution is I just don't read. Yeah, you know, I mean <laughs> I, I don't have any any editorial um, say mm. in any of the books that are generated in the in the Jet world. Yeah, have you read any of them? Uh, I've read I want to say three or four of them. Yeah, but there's something like thirty of them. So yeah, yeah. I mean, but how I did you? Time. How how did it? As a, as a, were you able to kind of um, disengage yourself as the creator of that character and that world and approach it in in a kind of a, a non-emotional reading? Way? No, I'm I'm terrible at that. It's it's also the reason why I can't listen to my own audio books. I mean, I just can't do it. Mm. I, I can't. I, I should be able to say, "Oh yes, I can't." Nah, it's, it'd be a lie. I mean, the only, the, actually, the only audiobook I, I've been able to listen to, the only take on mine, is the Black series, because mm. the the narrator just nailed it. But um, on the other ones, they do brilliant jobs. Dick Hill, who does the Assassin series, is a marvelous narrator, very, mm. very, very much in demand. He's a masterful actor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the problem for me is just the cadence. Of the when you, when you create craft prose, there's a certain musicality that you hear in your head, and I don't think that I mean it's an intensely personal cadence that you you shoot for, and you know I I, I don't I, that's your voice in a way. So when you to disengage to the point where you aren't being judgmental with your voice. Well, how true is this? You know, because you're used to reading about that character with your voice. Mm. So now you've got somebody, you know, jet, you know, rescues baby seals in in the Arctic. <laughs> well, okay, sure, you know, and then somebody else whose approach, whose voice is completely different. It's hard, yeah, as a content creator to 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 stomach it. But on the sl- same um, on the same point you're also capable of being surprised. Like I won't mention because I don't like playing favorites, but I read one take on it that, you know, I was kind of like, wow, that's, that's, I mean, I would have never gone that direction. (laughs) Mm. So it was, it was a a positive surprise. So you're not worried about the, some people might get a bit pressed about the brand. You know, you talked just now about not being too gritty uh, with your particular, with some of the series and yet somebody could take, you know, the Jet character and could inject all sorts of very gritty, who knows, sexual, violent, whatever things into the book. You're not worried no, I about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm say, now you're, you're, you're singing my song. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have a go. That's what I'm going to do. A Jet yeah, well, series. There you go. I think we just inked a deal. Yeah. What she does <laughs> with the baby. We're all excited. What she does with the baby seals, you don't want to know. Okay. There you go. Um, now let's uh, let's get on to a couple of questions because uh, believe it or not we've had we've had a load of questions in from um, students and followers in the Facebook group uh, who want to ping some things at you and one of them um, now I wasn't aware I have to say that you had one of these before I saw the question but a listener wants to know how you're getting on with your treadmill desk. Oh, it's it's, it's been a lifesaver. I, I'm 25 pounds lighter than I was when I started writing. I write eh, probably a couple hours a day walking on the treadmill desk, and I stand at it probably six hours a day. So I would absolutely unconditionally recommend it to anyone that's thinking about being a writer. Okay. I mean, the blood flows, you know, you're, you're, you're oxygenated. And the biggest killer is really that, you know, you weren't, your body wasn't meant to be sedentary for 10, 12 hours a day. It just wasn't. Yeah. So things don't work well. Nothing works. Your brain doesn't work. Nothing works well if you're sedentary. So plus you don't live as long. So if you can walk at a moderate pace, and I walk at around two miles per hour, 
So uh, I'm not really a, a racehorse. But the point is, if I walk for two hours, I've just clocked four miles. And I've probably, you know, written 2,000 words. Mm. So, hey, win-win. That's pretty good. Well, that's no, I would absolutely recommend it. It, t- it took me maybe a day and a half to get used to it, and now it's second nature. Okay, mm. well, that's uh, in Rob Wright's question. There's a follow-up, actually, from um, Zaria- Zariana Pradia, who asks, um, have you ever thought about writing a bestseller entitled How to Keep Fit, Become an Icon, and Make a Million? It's just a thought mm. of hers. Well, I, I, I would <laughs> perhaps how to um, abuse yourself, uh, become notorious. And, <laughs> well, I bought- already told you how to wind up with a million. Marry well. Yes, I mean, that's it. <laughs> that was the opening gambit. Okay, yeah. um, we've, asked, we've asked a couple of the questions that came up. Karen O'Connor wanted to ask about writing to market or writing what you love and i think you've answered that by saying you basically write what you love but you temper it perhaps you know 25 percent of the thought process is is tempering for the market i would agree with that it, look if you if you don't have a passion for what you're doing why, why are you doing it mm-hmm. so i'd just start there it's like look the chances of you making a living writing are very very slim and people hate it when they say that oh but you're not you know you're not you're, you're such a drag. It's not inspiring. And it's like, well, my job isn't to, to be inspiring. My job is to tell you the truth. And it, it, it is the exception, not the rule, that makes more than beer money being a writer. That's just the way it is. And if you need some false reality where that's not the case, I'm the wrong guy to talk to about it. Now, there's lots of people who will sell you seminars and books about how wonderful it is and, and how you're going to, you can do it if you can dream it. But reality tends to be a little harsher. Mm-hmm. And even a cursory understanding of the, the, the figures tells you that y- the odds are stacked against you. So just accept that. Understand it. You can't change it. Um, that's just how it is. So if you're going to do it, it better be because you have some real passion for what you're going to do. Because mm. it's likely that you're going to be about the only person that ever reads it. So, <laughs> you know, I, I yeah. mean, so might as well write something that you think is the best book you ever read. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, see, you see the logic to it? Yeah. And if, 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 if it is the best book that you've ever read of its type, um, there's a chance that other people might think the same thing. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, 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 between my traditional deals and then writing for myself, writing, you know, self-published stuff, I tried to write books that I thought the market wanted, and they weren't the books that I wanted to write. And I've never had, um, I've never had a situation where I had to kind of force myself to open the laptop to start writing. Normally, these days, I, I get itchy if I don't write at least a little a day. Um, but back back then, it was it was like pulling teeth. I hated it. I'd never do that again. Yeah, no, I trust me. I've been in that situation. I think certainly um, a few of the books that I've written over the last four years, um, four and a half now, four and a half years, you know, a few came very hard to the page and, and others were just flowed beautifully. Um, but the point being that the ones that didn't flow beautifully onto the page came after this became a money making endeavor. Mm hmm. And whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But I mean, it's just, I think every author hits that point in their professional life if they're making a living doing it where they feel the pressure of, you know, can I write something again that people want to buy? And that, that encounters their creative side. Their content creator is kind of like, but I want to write X, not more of that. Mm. So, I don't know. But if you're passionate, I mean, like this post-apocalyptic thing that I'm doing, I can't tell you how excited I am about it. And I'm cranking 7,500 words a day right now. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've been meaning to do I love post-apocalyptic as well. So, it's, um, it's, another, it's another thing yeah, I'd love to do. Opens, yeah, it opens up, I mean, the joy of, of creating this sort of, you know, <laughs> series of cascading likelihood scenarios and, you know, the road warrior future and all of that. I mean, you know, it's a lot of fun. So I'm waking up early just to to get to it. Yeah, yeah that's, the, that's the best sign. If, when, when you're in that kind of flow, it's... Um... Yeah, and, you know, there's been more than a few that I've just been, oh, God, you know, I, <laughs> anything I can find to not have to, to get to this right now, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, so I'll, when, I have to balance my checkbook. 
when that book is when that book is finished or when the series is finished how will you approach the marketing because you've got a mailing list now so we partly that you know, we we've had some together and you've been building for ages yourself how how will you um market uh, a post-apocalyptic series to to uh, readers of jet for example well i i'm for, uh, i'm gonna do a mailing um to i first of all i think that people that like jet are going to love the post-apocalyptic I mean, there's a lot of jet in it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's just a lot of that sort of pacing in action, but there's also a lot of, I mean, just there's, there's a lot more texture to it, but to, 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 to go to the, how do I intend to market it? My, my mailing list is now over 20,000 people. So fine. I'll send out a mailing to them. I plan to release the books April, May, and June. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to release bam, 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 one, two, and three, 30 days apart. You know, presuming my editor doesn't quit and uh, <laughs> my proofreader, <laughs> and I write them, um, and and uh, I also am going to enlist some of my friends that are in the same genre to to read the books and if they like them, you know, give me blurbs mm -hmm. and announce to their readership that hey, this may be something that you like because I liked it and you mm -hmm. may like it. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, so it's just kind of word of mouth and I'm confident enough in the content that between 20,000 or 22 or whatever it is I've got and, you know, my friends putting out the word um, and Facebook and Twitter, although I don't do very much Twitter anymore and my mm -hmm. blog, you know, I should be able to communicate effectively to the, to the world that this is available and you may want to give it a try. And I'm probably going to price it just insanely cheap mm. like the first book i'm probably gonna go out 2.99 or 3.99 which mm -hmm. you know for me i mean my ramsey series yeah no i'm, I'm going out at 6.99 yeah and you know selling briskly i have no complaints about it and jet i think when i do a well when i do a new release of pretty much anything i it's going to be 5.95 or 5.99 so to go out at 2.99 or 3.99 is a marked change in my strategy but again post-apocalyptic you know is a different audience and i'll probably go exclusive i'll probably go into kindle unlimited on that because when mm -hmm. i look at where the buying patterns are for that audience it's it's amazon i think i would if I, for the for at least for the first three months establish a base on amazon use ku um and then see how, you know, see how it is in three months, then maybe go wide, maybe six months go wide. Um, yeah, yeah, but I mean, I reserve the right to do that at all times, but I, I think, yeah. you know, go cheap and go, go, go narrow on the first one and see how that works. And then I've got, you know, 30 days for the second one. I can either take that one wide and, you know, take my lumps for 60 days while I'm not seeing any sales on the other platforms. Or I can I can wait for you know go go specific with that to to Kindle as well to Ku, but I don't know I mean it's interesting because it'll be an interesting experiment for me to go into a completely different genre, and see how well it translates. I think you I think it'll be fantastic. I mean I, I read your Facebook updates and they're they're always really interesting and provocative and so I can I think I can see perhaps I can see a political angle that that might coming into into this series um oh yeah no there's there's definitely some some room for for getting up on the soapbox but i think you have to also <laughs> temper your natural enthusiasm to do that or you lose the audience because <laughs> at the end of the day they want yeah they want the story yeah 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 um, hey, although one of, the, one of the things that's fun about it is it does give you a little more room to play with the philosophy of the entire thing because if the world's if come crashing down around you there's some deeply philosophical questions that, you know, people are going to be asking themselves in terms of just, you know, what does this all mean? How do we progress from here? What have we learned? If anything, is this part of or are the atrocities and, that we're seeing every day just, you know, ingrained in human nature? Are we really such dark beasts that this is the best we can do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's plentiful, you know, there's plentiful data to mine there and sort of, I find it more substantive um, and more interesting to me than maybe, you know, something like Ramsey's. It's more, there's the treasure. Let's go find it. Mm. Well, I'll tell you what's <laughs> yeah. interesting about it. Also, we're obviously we're sitting here in Europe and we are a few hundred miles away from people who are effectively living in a post-apocalyptic landscape. 
um, and trying yeah, to escape. Yeah, I was. I, it's interesting you say that because I was thinking about that. I actually wrote some pages yesterday where I addressed that and sort of went, you know, you know, for Americans, this is this America had has this reality that it's carefully crafted that the world is is a relatively safe place, and yet. If you live in Syria or Iraq or you know a lot of other places in the world, it, it's not. Mm -hmm. And I would maintain the world's never been a safe place. When the Mongol hordes were, were sweeping across Asia or the Byzantine Empire or the, the barbarians were, were taking over Europe, I mean, it's never been a safe place. And it's just fascinating to me that when you've got a culture who's, who's – thesis is that you know we're morally superior and superior just in terms of the way the form of government we have etc cetera, etc cetera, and a byproduct of that will be we're safe when all that collapses it becomes very obvious you know in 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 this world that i've created that the world's always been a dangerous place this is artificial the reality is it is dangerous hmm. And yes, you're in, in the UK, and if you're in the south of France in Provence right now sipping wine, it probably doesn't seem that dangerous. But if you're breathing, if you're breathing depleted uranium dust that's blown by the Scirocco winds north, um, yeah, it is more dangerous. You just don't realize it. Yeah, well, I think that's a really interesting area, but it probably one of the reasons why post-apocalyptic is is in the same way that it dominated Japanese culture for 20 years, 30 years, and even into the 70s, it's um, it's starting to feature, isn't it, in, uh, uh, in certain video games, a lot of Fallout, things like that, a lot of uh, post-apocalyptic scenes. Anyway, let's... I think, I think that that's a, a reliable indicator that things are breaking down. Hmm. I mean, I think or that, that, that the anxiety level is increasing over reality. In other words, when you have this cognitive dissonance that that maybe reality isn't um, what the mainstream media or what my the educational system is telling me it is, and maybe it's something far more ominous and dangerous, I think that a release valve for that is is reading fiction that explores that darker possibility. Mm -hmm. that, if that makes any sort of sense yeah. it's more cathartic no. you're, you're more interested yeah. in it because your thoughts yeah. are more <laughs> just naturally gravitating in that direction yeah uh, really interesting. I, I really want to get a couple more of the questions in before we go. I'm, I'm acutely aware that we're taking a lot of your time so far this evening, but Doug Doro has um, posted a couple of questions. Uh, one of those, uh, he says, NDAs apart, um, are there any lessons you can share from working so closely with Clive Cussler? Yeah, I think uh, one, one of the things I learned and became acutely aware of and much better at is pacing. Um, in other words, any you know, cut, cut the bullshit. In other words, don't don't overwrite and cut the 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 parts of the book that um, aren't essential to the story. I've become much more laser focused since working with Clive. You know, I've done two books with him. I did uh, the Eye of Heaven and I did the Solomon Curse. And I have to say that in terms of my my personal approach to my books, I've seen an evolution in terms of pacing and in terms of my approach to story. Because now when I outline, I am ruthless. And I wrote a blog about, I don't remember, maybe two weeks ago, maybe a month ago, that talks about, um, you know, the secret to writing a page turner. And I, that's one of the takeaways that I got from working with Clive was, you know, every chapter has to do its work. It's got to do heavy lifting. It's got to have a surprise. It's got to have a twist. It's got to have reversals. It's got to have, you know, if possible, an action beat. It's got to create a series of burning questions that the reader absolutely must know the answer to and compels them to turn the page. Um, all of that I kind of got out of having to think through story better from working with Clive. All right, that's really interesting. And I so I would have paid to do that. Yeah, <laughs> and you got paid. 
Right. So, yeah. so yes. I went win win. Win yeah. win. I mean, I, I obviously I'm at the beginning end, but this is something that occupies me a lot, and I'm sure people are setting out in writing. Is it's not quite as crude as saying how much do I write, but I I did a little experiment with one of my chapters where. Um, you know, there's a very specific thing I know the guy needs to do, my character needs to do, and I wrote it as frugally as possible. And it came out at about 4,000 words. This chapter really, really was short, and he, he, he went in and got the thing di- done. I'm now thinking about it. It's a couple of days later, and I actually thought today why I needed to take more time to get him in there. And it, was, it wasn't actually... T- wasn't the story pushing that along the narrative it was people understanding his experience of what happened so although i am now going to go back and make it longer and fluff it out i think it still fits in with what you're saying and the reason i'm writing that is because people need to understand how he was feeling and how he got to where he want was in his mind before the thing happened so mm-hmm. it's still being focused but i and I, I wrestle with this quite a lot um you know how how much you write basically because i enjoy reading the description you know when i read mark's books and your i've been mean, some of your passages are it, it, those little bits of detail that tell you the bigger story and that might feel a bit like fluff at the time but i guess that's that's when you are writing purposefully even if it doesn't necessarily drive the story in that sentence does that make sense yeah no i think it's a balancing act though i think you you know i think that certainly for the type of writers i read you know that i admire james lee burke is a, a perfect example mm. the man's you know his 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 knowledge of craft is amazing i mean his 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 descriptive capability his word choice the, the man is a master so you know i i aspire to that but i i recognize i don't have the level of talent or the 60 years of writing experience he has but um i think that you know just because you are trying to to structure your story so that it requires the reader to turn the page to find out what happens next doesn't mean that it has to be six six word sentences and um, the cat saw the rat. It doesn't have to be the Hardy Boys. You can introduce lyricism in there, and there's a place for it to to put the reader into a sense of place, what what, what it smells like, mm. what the protagonist is feeling, all of that sensory nuance you can also include, but man, oh, man, you know, it better move the story forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I think less is more. I mean, my favorite part of the edit is when I when I – cut things out um because i know that every word i'm taking away is is tightening the novel yeah. making it quicker flow and also you, you just have to trust the reader if you look at a film like um reservoir dogs with the the ear slicing scene um everyone rem- remembers that as being particularly graphic and gory but the truth is you don't see it you don't see anything it's all in your mind so yeah hitchcock was great at that yeah absolutely he yeah. really was and and yeah there's some of that it's it's uh, you know, it's difficult. It's, again, it comes down to voice, and it also comes down to the story you're trying to tell, it, it, it just personal style. But I, I tend to, when I, as a reader, I tend to, you know, try to write like the people I admire, not, and I don't necessarily admire commercial success as much as I do grasp of craft. Mm. In other words, if I had a choice between selling a million books or... 250,000 books and one could be written in a more lyrical um, way that would 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 have my peers going this is amazing versus something that would be perhaps more commercially successful but more pedestrian and sophomoric I think I would err to the side of the 250,000 seller Mm. I just would that's just my nature Mm. So I don't know, maybe, you know, that's why I'll never be James Patterson. That's fine. I don't need to be. You know, I'm very happy um, that the world's been receptive <laughs> to, 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 to the stuff I've written. I mean, really, I, I well, can't complain. You're doing well, right. you, you can buy You can buy a hell of a lot of tequila with, with 250,000 books. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't. I, I, you know, the post op, you know, thing could go that direction. I mean, really, it's probably one of the things, few things that I've written that really has the possibilities of doing that. All the jets sold more than that. So, yeah. So. You know, but I think, you know, I remember I had this feeling when I was writing Jet. I was like, man, you know, this is either going to bomb or it's great. It's going <laughs> to be one or the other. <laughs> it's not going to be in between. And I, I sort of have that feeling right now as I write this one. It's called The Day After Never. 
and the first book is called Blood Honor, and it's just I've just got that feeling. It's got that that tingly feeling when you're like, shit, this might actually be good. I'm looking forward to reading it. Yeah, really. yeah. I am as well. Um, Russ, I've got one final question for you. I think the Clive Custler books were ebooks, were they not? But ha- have you been traditionally published so far, or would you accept a trad publishing deal? Well, I mean, I'm a whore, so sure. Yeah, <laughs> you know, throw throw enough money at me, I, I'll do anything. I I would <laughs> trust me. I would do anything. No, I you know, and if some of them have been traditionally published, like you know. Um, I don't know how many, one, two, three, maybe five or six, no, probably eight or nine of the books now have been bought by a company in Germany, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, um, and traditionally published. Um, I'm negotiating a deal right now for audio books. Um, so I, you know, I have nothing against the traditional publishing system. I had a wonderful time working with Neil Nyman over at the uh, Putnam when I was working on the on the Clive stuff so I recognize it has a time and a place and I think that it can it's very good at getting your your product in front of readers in a retail scenario assuming the publisher puts its back into it Hmm. but I'm not sure how you how you guarantee that the traditional publisher is actually going to do anything besides shotgun it out with another 300,000 titles that are going to hit the shelves this year and just see which ones start start trending and then back those because that seems to be how that industry works. Yeah, well, that's, that was your experience, Mark, wasn't it? Don't get me started on that. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. And, uh, you know, would, would look, the record business, you know, years ago I played music and produced people and did a bunch of stuff, and it, it was the same. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you had yeah. 100 acts signed. They were all good. They were all, you know, tall enough to get on the ride. But yeah. the record company would put the same 100 grand behind every single one of them, give each one of them a, a video. And it didn't really know which one was going to go break big. It really didn't. But the one, when it started trending, that's where they put their back into. And the other 99 just were forgotten. Yeah. It's always been the way. Well. Oh. It's yeah, it's it's a shotgun effect. So I I'm not sure I'm the right personality type to to um, entrust my future and my career to a bunch of other perhaps more disinterested parties. Yeah, especially when you know you demonstrate that you can almost certainly do it better than they can anyway. So you know, well, would I wouldn't you, say would that, it? but I mean uh, that's very kind of you. It's very flattered, but uh, I think I, I, I let me put it this way: I think that I can reach a sufficient number of readers and communicate to them that I have a product that they would be interested in, and then deliver a product that's good enough so they feel like you know coming back for more and that they got good value for their money. To and I, I feel like I can do that enough to where I don't really need traditional publishing. If there was a good fit, I'd be more than happy to take the right deal. But it's not like I will go to my grave with regret if I never got a traditional publishing deal. Russell, it's um, we've ticked well past the hour mark. It's been uh, it's been truly great talking to you. It really has. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, one of our taglines in the podcast is it's a great time to be a writer. When I scroll down your list on Amazon I think what a great time it is to be a reader and you've got these books for free to start you off and then the books that follow up you know not that long ago before this whole revolution happened we were paying seven eight nine pounds a paperback ten eleven twelve bucks a paperback and here your your books are in the UK at least sort of between three and four five pounds you've got the book series coming out in the summer which is going to be you know discount and yeah, what a great time to be a reader uh, when you've got great authors like yourself churning them out. Well, I think, yeah, and I'm a reader, so I, yeah. I went on both sides. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great, hasn't it, Mark? Yeah, absolutely. It was a pleasure. It's the first time we've actually spoken, I think, about this, isn't it? But it's, uh... Yeah, it, it, certainly, uh, other than emails, but that doesn't really count. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been, it's been really, really great fun. Thanks for coming on. Well, it was my pleasure. I, I, you know, anytime you want me back, uh, I'll be more than happy to. There we go, Russell Blake. What a great uh, guy to talk to. Really, fu- really fun chap to to talk to, and somebody who's a little bit like you, Mark, in the sense that he gets nitty about it. He understands how it works, and he kind of uh, very quickly adapts to different techniques and makes them work for him. Gets nitty about it. I've never been described yeah. as nitty before. <laughs> nitty. Uh, it's a poker um, he, term, isn't it? Yeah. Nitty. Well, you know more about poker than I do. So yeah, he 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 is. He's um 
he's very very smart I and mean, he works really really hard that's one thing i think that comes out from that um the interview with, with him is is that it nothing, this is not easy um no one said that self-publishing was going to be an easy way to make a lot of money um it's easier than than traditional publishing but it still requires a lot of hard work it requires um the ability to switch hats change your mindset and go from being creative um to being a business person and be prepared to, to market and promote yourself that's essential um, and just you know, tenaciousness and doggedness, something that I think that came through really um, powerfully. Russell has has both of those attributes um, in spades. Yeah, and you talked a, a bit about, uh, the two of you talked about the sort of motivation of writing and, and enjoying your writing and, and getting on with this. And I just, as a noob in this area, just wanted to chip in and say that I think all, before you've had any success at all, before you've written your book, before the first person's bought it, you've had any reviews, um, that's a different type of motivation that's needed. Um, and it's something we might go into um, with other authors in the future as well, that uh, that motivation and um, sitting down and knuckling down and writing when actually in the back of your mind, there's no strong sense of confidence that you're going to sell stuff. Whereas you and Russell are in a different place there. You've got proven success behind you. Your motivation is slightly different. So I'm just, just putting that in there, putting that out there for us newbies. It's not necessarily the same uh, uh way of looking at things when you think about how do I motivate, motivate myself to write I think that's uh, we, we've um, we should probably change the schedule around James next week will be Mark kicks James's ass yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> to get on with it exactly get on with it too too much too lazy you're not writing fast enough get yeah, on with it yeah that is exactly what i need <laughs> thank you very much indeed for listening we can't wait to be back with you on the, the next time out uh visit us on our facebook group email us if you want at support at selfpublishingformula.com and we'll see you next time bye bye and don't forget you can win a great prize by helping spread the word about this podcast visit selfpublishingformula.com forward slash contest to enter the prize on offer is Mark Dawson's acclaimed paid premium course Facebook advertising for authors. A course which isn't available to anyone at the moment by the way. It also includes Twitter advertising for authors with further modules to come including YouTube ads for authors. And you can give yourself more than one chance to win. Just pop along to our dedicated page at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash contest. You've been listening to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. Music